is uh, something that's been kind of culminating for the past three years since we basically started Nexus. So, I mean, all of you are familiar with some of the current technologies that it has and how it solves current issues in the blockchain, but, you know, kind of like second mouse gets a cheese, we've been sitting back for about three years and watching the industry evolve and seeing exactly how we can improve it and what types of things need to be changed in order for it to fully scale and seeing how some of the centralization of the mining power has been happening or how we see, you know, we have these mining pools that control things and how blocks should have been a vote, but, you know, now people don't have equal access to that and how we have quantum computers that are on the rise and how SHA-256 is being weakened by the proof of work, as we know, because Hashcast is essentially finding partial collisions, which means <clears throat> when you have a hash, it's just think of it as a digital fingerprint. So a partial collision is kind of like a partial match of that fingerprint. So those are obviously more difficult to find than, you know, a conventional one because because, you know, it should be more difficult to find. That's what gives us security to it. So I'm presenting here. I guess we can pull down the pull down the thing. I just wanted to give a brief intro on it. I'm going to be presenting the architecture of Nexus and what it's going to be coming in. I guess you could call it our scaling solution, or you could call it, I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll get to it. What do you call it? Whatever you want. But it's a new architecture that I've been working on on paper and thinking about and designing and going through with other people and other architects and figuring out, okay, well, what's the best way that we can take these distributed database systems, which is what a blockchain is, and turn them into something that's going to be truly capable of mainstream adoption. Because right now, you know, Bitcoin and crypto are blowing up everywhere, but the transaction capacity is very small. Blocks obviously have the size constraints, for some for a decent reason, where you have your block and you don't want to have too big because, I mean, blocks are kind of like giant freight trains carrying all this data. And so, you know, and think of transactions like little boxes being loaded into there. So this is expanding on the initial ideas of the blockchain and taking it to a completely new architecture that also through this three-part update series we call the Tau, which is Tritium, Amin, and Obsidian, it will be able to transition any Bitcoin-based blockchain into a nexus chain if we want to call it that and that's one of the reasons we actually started from the bitcoin source is because it was proven and we wanted to work off of that and improve it from there and then also have something that can be transitionable to take into account quantum security to take into account decentralized trust mechanisms to take into account scalability so this is the architecture of nexus so I can't read that too well. Oh well, we'll figure it out. Okay, so basically, uh, D, can you bring a computer up here? I need to see it. I can't see it from here. I need to read off of it. But anyway, you guys can see it here. So I mean, basically, so we have, it's a flood network, right? So that means every single node has to receive every single message. So. The problem with that is that it's kind of like if you have a package that goes out, it has to hit every single city in the entire world. And then everybody from that city can start building up on it. And there's no definitive roles on anything. And that's, that's kind of a problem that we have right now because every single node is doing the same exact thing. And so there's so much extra processing that can be split up among others. But you have the problem with what's called the Sybil attack. Now, a Sybil attack basically means that somebody can flood the network with a bunch of nodes. It was actually named after the lady with uh, multiple personalities. I think it was like 17 because it's kind of impersonating an honest node in order to look like you're honest and change those things. Let's see. Pull this here. Here we go. So first one is, uh, so right now there's two types of things. So whenever a transaction goes out in the network, it has to be accepted in the memory pool because the UTXO set needs to be checked. And so from that, all of the miners then select from this memory pool and they create these blocks. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. Now, there's some constraints with it as well because you basically, you have the block size right now. I'll get to that in a second. There's been this huge debate that's been going on for a long time because right now the UTXO set has to basically contain an input and then two outputs. So your input is basically what you're spending. So that's called unspent transaction output. And then your two outputs, you have your change transaction and then the regular transaction. So what that basically does is it was kind of designed to be kind of a form of obfuscation in uh, the actual direction and movement. Thank you very much. Sorry about that, guys. 
it was designed to be kind of a pseudo-anonymous system where you can mix the inputs and you can control these types of things. But one of the problems with that is they, you know, already have been developing AI algorithms that can actually start tracing through this. So UTXO as a form of anonymity is really not the best and it's highly inefficient because it carries an extremely high overhead. Because some transactions, you know, could have outputs of let's say one nexus. And so in order to send a thousand nexus, you need a thousand inputs, which means you need a thousand signatures that need to be verified. A thousand signatures need to be signed. And then every one of those transactions, or every one of those signatures, I mean, in Bitcoin would be something like this. Because you have to include the public key, and then you have to include the signature of it because that's how elliptic curve, or I mean, asymmetrical encryption works anyway, where you have a digital signature can be verified with a public key, but only the private key can create it. So. Every node needs every block that's created to store the chain as a whole. Now that creates a huge data overhead. And as the block size grows, and I mean, it, it just creates more and more overhead on it. Like I said, it's like a giant freight ship. So I mean, if you have these giant semis that the roads can't handle, it's gonna create a lot of problems. And right now the infrastructure can't really handle all of these things. So they've been working on some ideas with segregated witness, which is actually taking the signatures out of the blocks, which is a very good step forward because you're basically not having to carry all that data through the block, and so therefore you can fit more transactions on there. And then they've also been doing some optimizations where they cache the signatures when they're received in the memory pool, which is good because then you don't have to verify them twice. But still, in the ultimate, you know, if we have, especially when we start getting our cube satellites, I mean, every little byte needs to count here. It needs to be as efficient as possible because we don't want to be setting a transaction up just to have a block sent up with the same transactions in it. It's, it's inefficient. So, Another problem that we have is transaction fees are increasing rapidly and is another market with block size constraints. And then miners have no incentive to, um, or miners have an incentive to suppress the block size because they earn more money off the transaction fees. I mean, last I saw it was 80, 90, 150% increase in transaction fees where it's even becoming more expensive to send Bitcoin on a microtransaction than you're actually sending. So, speeding up the block time as a solution, as you know, we know Ethereum did that, and there's two ways to really scale it, is block size or block speed, you know, block time, but, you know, that kind of creates problems. Bitcoin can't really change the block time because the difficulty is what actually controls the inflation. So, that's a very, very pivotal part. That's why Dash had the hyperinflation in the beginning, because it's not based on a time delusion, it's based on a block number, and the hash cash, as we know it in the proof of work, is, for lack of better words, very random. So you could see a block come in a minute, you could see a block come in 15 minutes, that's why there's a 2016 block retarget time for Bitcoin because you have to get a very consistent average of it. So as we can see with Ethereum, they covered uh, the orphan problem with uncles, but that creates massive more inflation because I think they allow up to 80% to go. So orphan rates go up significantly, security is severely degraded as well because you have all these blocks coming out it's gonna to have to have more confirmations because you're gonna to have to sync it deeper into the chain and it's very easy to make these blocks if it only takes 15 seconds or 10 seconds so you don't need as much computing power to power out these blocks. Now, so here's the analogy of blocks are like a giant freight ship that moves slowly and carrying a large load. Faster time compounds this efficiency. So if you think about it, the bigger these freight ships and the faster they move, it's big things don't move very fast, especially when we have limited bandwidth. Some people in third worlds may not be able to download these things and that's one of the main cores and cruxes of the block size debate. So Satoshi and the block size, I think I wanted to address this here because a lot of people I think have forgotten this. Now, Satoshi didn't include a block size initially and then they kind of put it at 20 megabytes and then they realized, okay, we should put it at one megabyte. They added a cap because Bitcoin back then was worth pennies. So it would be very easy for a transaction spammer to just spam the network, especially what they do is they do dust spam. So they'll do, you know, 0.1 Bitcoin inputs and thousands of those. And I mean, there's been some transactions that are 970 kilobytes that took up a whole block because the UTXO set just becomes increasingly heavy. So from Bitcoin Talk, quoting him, here's the link if you guys want to verify it. It can be phased in, like if block number is greater than 115000. Now, that's actually where people started realizing how to change consensus rules. And he says, max block size equals larger limit. It can start being in versions way ahead. So by the time it reaches the block number and goes into effect, the older versions that don't already have it are already, already obsolete. When we're near the cutoff block number, I can put an alert to old versions to make sure they know they have to upgrade. That's Satoshi. So in the whole block size debate, I think if Satoshi came out and said this, I think it would have added a lot of weight to a lot of the conclusions. Now, you know, the criticism of block size being increased and not being a good scaling solution is kind of criticizing the initial architecture of Satoshi, which is fine. I mean, criticism of work is what makes it strong, but the fact is, 
not accounting for Satoshi's original opinion, which was obviously on Bitcoin talk, is something that I think has allowed this to go on a little too far, creating massive transaction backlogs. I think it's standard 50 to 100,000. Segregated witness looks like it's kind of partially worked. I mean, I see very little decrease in block size, but that's probably because the transaction backlogs are coming up. So. Bitcoin Core uses LevelDB, which was made by Google. They transferred that from uh, BerkeleyDB, which they used to use, which is slow as dog, man. Very bad. But so the reason they do that, though, is there's something called, it's a class called C-Block Index. So it's kind of a very baseline, rudimentary, very primitive type of database where it's just different files and then a binary position in that file. So C-Block Index also caches the header of the block so that you can get the block time because you have to do a lot of these calculations as you're going through new blocks, especially you have to calculate the proof of work, you have to calculate your times, you have to have your average. So the C-Block Index has to be loaded completely into memory, which right now for Nexus is about a gigabyte and a half. Now for Bitcoin, it's far bigger than that because it's caching all of this data and it needs that data. Otherwise, it has to search through every byte on all of these BLK001, 002 files or to find the exact binary position where that starts because it's just a raw serialized dump on a disk. Now, BerkeleyDB is still used in Bitcoin. It's uh, version 4.8 for the wallet.dat. Now, I've seen wallet.dat's corrupt sometimes, which is a bit of a problem. BerkeleyDB, especially 4.8, I mean, it was just there to work. It's a good, it's a standard C++ database. It's got good paging. It, it's got acid transactions and everything, which is very good. But it's still, I mean, the reason I created the lower level database is, you know, from criticisms of how long it took to load up because Nexus has a lot more data that it has to initialize with. And Mirax, of course, here it goes again, was like, this is unacceptable. And I'm like, okay, well, just build a new database. That'll make it work faster. So we got our loading time from 20 minutes down to a minute and a half with a lower level database. And that actually opened a whole new plethora of features from it because now it's a database designed specifically for a decentralized system. It's built from the ground up with only things that are needed for that because when you have more generic databases, they have a lot of generic processing that's happening that you don't necessarily need to be half happening. So C block index is a form of basic database allowing binary position of the block data and transactions, CTX index, to be stored in memory. Now CTX index is actually where spent and unspent comes in. It's V spent, V unspent, and it's a CTX out doing that to act as a flag. So CTX index is very important if you see that because that's actually what is checked on the memory pool and that is one of the core parts that prevents somebody from double spending. But the flag in it was just done for debugging purposes to make it a little simpler but it simply just needs to be a boolean flag or you can do different architectures for it. So it requires gigabytes of memory on hand. Now the BLK00X is the raw block data using simple files for block data dumps. So it's a lot faster but it requires massive memory footprint from C block index and loading the whole index when the node client boots up. So data is processed by every node. This is another problem because, you know, it's also a solution in the sense too because every node being able to verify one another is something that allows the security model to take place. But data, I mean, how should I say it? We, there's more advantageous methods that can be done and that's where I'll get into the trust system that kind of proof of work is, how should we say it, uh, a, beginning type of trust system to prevent Sybil attacks because you put a cost on producing the blocks, on verifying the data, and that cost is so astronomical that therefore it is going to be very unlikely that somebody would be able to attack it. That's why the general consensus is as difficult it goes up, the network becomes more secure. So when more complex scripting engines are developed, especially those that are Turing complete, it opens up a series of vectors that inhibit the scalability of nodes. Now, data processed by every node creates a chain reaction of decreased propagation time as the slowest node creates a bottleneck. Now, messages in Bitcoin Core are processed in a queue as well. So this means that slower messages from other nodes or DDoS attacks on the protocol can cause block propagation delays, such as the example of one block taking 20 seconds to process, which I think is the historical longest block. Now, you compound that. Let's say it has to go through five nodes in order to get to the final route. That's, uh, you know, close to a minute already. We'll answer questions at the very end. Just uh, hold that thought. And then if every need, node needs to process before relaying to the network, orphan rates can increase significantly, giving miners incentive to release empty blocks. And that also goes back into the crux of the block size debate. Well, mom and pop can't do this. Well, you know, I mean, part of the block propagation time is also on the actual socket level network protocol. So blockchains consume a lot of resources. Now, every node has to store all the data, which makes it very difficult for the average user to run a full Bitcoin node. This reduces the security of the network by making it easier to take down, you know, the network if there's node count is lower. So, you know, as a resource input goes higher, another 
argument for the block size debate. Mom and pop can't run a node, but I mean, I really would have to set up a specialized computer right now to run a Bitcoin node. It's very resource intensive. The memory requirements of Bitcoin are extreme with the way that blockchain is indexed and copies the block header stored in C block index, which every one of those block headers, I think, I believe is 300 bytes, if I remember correctly. And so you multiply that by millions or thousands and thousands of blocks, it becomes very, very resource intensive when it's already on the disk, but it has to be held in memory because it has to have that end file position and it has to have the binary position as well. So as the node count goes up, the network slows down since the socket level program is all handled on one thread, which means all the data has to be processed one by one by one by one by one. So, I mean, you have 100 connections, it gets extremely slow. Plus, since the messages are processed in a queue, if you have thousands of transactions per second, you're gonna have to be verifying thousands of signatures per second, and then you might not even get to a block that you already received on the protocol level a minute ago because you're processing all these other things, and that slows down everything. So it just, the bigger Bitcoin, Bitcoin's a victim of its own success in that form where the bigger it gets, the slower it gets. And the slower it gets, the harder it get is for us, normal guys, to be sending Bitcoin. So we need to have some improvements on these levels. And these are some things that I've been addressing. Now, another big thing that I think is not as well known, it's getting more well known with the ICOs, is blockchains are not quantum resistant. So using short algorithm, one can reverse a key in polynomial time. This means the classical computer would take two to the 256 iterations to crack a Bitcoin SCCP 256K1 key, and a quantum computer would only take 256 cubed, which is a very, very ridiculously low number comparatively. It's polynomial time and exponential time are very significant. And knowing that, it's <laughs> it renders it insecure. I mean, it would take about 1721 qubits in order for that to happen, but this is a significant reduction making the cracking keys feasible within 10 to 100 years. But you know what makes the security of a blockchain or what makes the security of a key is it's such an astronomical more years than the number of years of the known universe. So that's how we can generally see it because everything can be brute force. So, you know, I mean, you have the password that's ABC. It's not going to be too hard to crack because somebody can just go in and type in ABC and they got your password. So it's kind of a similar thing with cracking these keys. So, and there's really no post-quantum cryptography ready for production, right? Yeah, I think NIST has started opening a new competition. There's a lot of promise in lattice-based cryptography, but right now we mainly use RSA and uh, ECC. So ECC has smaller key sizes, RSA has very large key sizes, but they're based on two mathematical problems called the integer factorization problem, which is using the prime numbers for RSA, and then there's a discrete logarithmic problem, which is what's using for the ECC curves. So with that being in mind, we have to come up with some solutions immediately. And that's one reason we're using larger key sizes because that has a higher qubit requirement. So therefore we can kind of time the time because we're looking at about five years for fully functional quantum computers. They actually just found a way to make silicone based quantum computers, which I mean, we're talking millions of qubits once those get all the way. Now the Google D wave is at 2000 to 4000 qubits. So it's a, they're kind of like ASICs, if you want to think of them like that. There's no universal quantum computer, but they're getting real close. And I mean, it all compounds and accelerates that way too, because when you get more people, when you get more people working on it and more computing power, you can do more pre-calculations, and then you can keep finding better and better solutions, and it's exponential. So Grover's algorithm reduces the hash of security of 256 bits to 128 bit quantum secure, making Bitcoin hashes using 256 bits. So that's another problem too, not as big. All you have to do is just upgrade your key sizes. That's why we're using 512-bit transaction hashes. So we have 256-bit quantum security and 1024-bit block hashes for a little bit more security on there. So that's got 512-bit quantum security and then our public keys that are hashed, the hash of that is using 256 bits. So that's 128-bit quantum security. And I also do another hash with a 576 bit. So that becomes very difficult to reverse the public key from the actual hash and the address so that you never have to reveal the public key until the transaction is sent. All right, <laughs> sorry, take a pause, I'll take a pause, all right. That's what everyone's telling me, Colin, breathe, take a pause. <laughs> so, now, the world sucks if we got problems and no solutions, right? So, here's where it gets fun, because there's all our problems, there's our download. Now, let's look at some of the core problems here. Transaction fees are too high, as Ernie likes to say, I want to buy my bubble gum. So, you know, I mean, and... You know, if we want to get mainstream, somebody's going to want to buy bubble gum. And if your transaction fee is higher than actual transaction value, we got a big problem. Now, number two, resource requirements are way too high, hence the block size debate. Now, we can go back on the Satoshi side and whatever. His scaling solution was Moore's Law, but Bitcoin, I think, has exceeded his expectations. 
and scaled a lot faster than Moore's law. So that comes into us having to develop new architectures. Now, three, transactions process too slow. I don't know if any of you guys have had your Bitcoin stuck in limbo for a day, two days, and you look at the transaction backlog and we'd be like, this is not working. Why has this been going on for two years? We need to do something about it. So anyway, number four, mining pools centralized the protocol. Big problem. Bitmain has about 70-80% of all the ASIC production. They actually tried an insidious attack on the network putting in Antbleed, which basically was a little protocol message upgrading the firmware that says if their servers are unreachable, your miner will magically shut down. Which, bad, 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 bad. 70-80% of the miners go out, 51% attack anybody? Anyway, and now I think it's about seven or eight people in the world control the Bitcoin protocol with mining pools. Now, the problem with this is it's us people giving them the mining power. And it's another pyramid like we got. And these guys at the top of their mining pool are controlling everything because they don't have to do what the miners say. The miners are giving them the hash. They can do whatever the hell they want. That's a problem. Number five, energy requirements for security are way too high. Plus, the use of that energy is only useful in Bitcoin. There needs to be other use cases, and it needs to not have a security model based upon energy consumption because it's just an arms race. And if you even look at the block, if you ever see, a, what is it, a zero block, it's, you'll see the block time is usually always about seven minutes, eight minutes, because ASICs are coming out so rapidly, they're always inflating the supply. Now keep that in mind, seven minute block times means 25% inflation on Bitcoin because the block time is what regulates the supply. That's another problem because Bitcoins are being made faster than they were anticipated to be made. So we really have no idea how many Bitcoins are gonna be. We have a relative guess, but we don't really know in exact time. Now, as Ernie said, microtransactions aren't possible on chain, so they have off-chain solutions. Again, sounds more like mining pools, centralized solutions to a decentralized network, I think kind of contradictory ideas. I don't know about you guys, but I'm personally about decentralization. You know what I mean? Decentralized, the decentralization. And that's what that means. Because we have this decentralized Bitcoin, but it's still got centralized points in it. It needs to be decentralized further because everything kind of forms like, you know, if we think about this the relationship between a mother and a child, like the child is, it's, it's drawn from the mom. The mom is a central source of that. And then the child grows up and it decentralizes its life by meeting friends and making connections and building its life out. And by the end of its life, it's so decentralized. It's not needing just one person or one thing. Well, except the, you know, Fed, but we'll get to that another time. But <laughs> basically, everything starts centralized. So, I mean, I'm not looking at this with a negative light. It's fine, it's okay. It's growing pains for Bitcoin. And that's why it's kind of nice to kind of be sitting back for the last few years. And you know, Nexus has always been kind of a cryptic puzzle. Puzzle, Keith knows that. And it was kind of, cause like we weren't out to make the price go up. We were out to make technology and to improve it. Technology that could also be used for Bitcoin because I've seen enough consumption in this space. Somebody needs to give back. And the last person I saw that really gave was Satoshi. Yeah, right? We need to give back. I mean, isn't there any gratitude left in this world? Come on, geez. I mean, we all wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Satoshi. So like, Satoshi, wherever you are, thank you. I think we should all give a round of applause to him. So number seven, all right. Blocks are votes. Now that's, if you read the original Bitcoin white paper, that's how Satoshi said it. Every CPU has a vote. Well. That didn't take into account the you know, crazy arms race we have. So now the vote's in the hands of about seven or eight people. Seven or eight people. Just let that sink in. Now, contracts don't need to be Turing complete. Now, smart contracts are not a new idea. They've been around for a long time. There was white papers that were made about it forever. There was already successful implementations of it, of saying we can create these decentralized cryptographic contracts. Now, Satoshi designed the Bitcoin protocol not to be Turing complete because you don't need to do everything in Turing complete. You don't need to have an infinite loop. Do we have infinite paper loops? No. I mean, we got big stacks of papers, but they never go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, right? You know, I mean, that's kind of bad programming practice if you have to do it, unless you're making like a game or something, whatever. But now, number nine is Bitcoin should be trustless but you have to trust somebody. You have to know what node to trust. You have to trust the developers. We have to trust Blockstream. We have to trust the mining pools. We have to trust the people that are making all the decisions for us. Now, personally, I, I mean, I, I love to trust people, but I also 
have found that trust comes from verifying. And we have very limited ability to verify any of these things that are happening. We got Blockstream doing what they're doing with their satellite PR gimmicks, you know, renting some bandwidth. Yeah, it's a little bit step up, but you know, I mean, I think it's kind of a step down because now it's one company that's controlling that. But I'm not going to get too negative about anything on that. It's, you know, it's a step forward for us, which is good. And it's bringing a lot of recognition to the fact that we need some satellites. And that's where we get into the CubeSats later. But now, blockchains are a distributed immutable database. Now, that's something that everyone talks about, this blockchain this, blockchain that. Now, I just wanted to do this to bring some clarity to everybody about what it really is. Because it's a database that cannot be changed. And it's distributed, which means it's all over the world. It's not just on one server. So that creates a very robust, rigid system. And that's where we can have the transactions, because a transaction is a transfer of data. If you deal with databases, you deal with database transactions. Banks, all they're doing is swapping numbers with database transactions. So that's how these things work. So the architecture of a blockchain allows an immutable ledger or database that is verified by all nodes. Breath. All right, I got it. <laughs> Trust comes in the form of proof of work and is in the hands of only a few people, mining pools, and requires a lot of electricity to secure. Blocks are like giant freight ships, again, that analogy. So they move very slowly through the network. Number four, blocks are the authority. Even if a transaction has been broadcasted and known by the network, it can still be ignored at the authority of the miner. Number five, there is no requirement for transactions to be included in blocks, leaving it to the good graces of the mining pool to include transactions in blocks. And we all see the empty blocks happen from time to time. They try to squeeze them in there when they can. Personally, I don't like that. Miners should be, you know, servicing the people. I mean, they're making enough money, aren't they? So, I mean, I think that's what it's for. So, where is Nexus headed? This is where we get to the fun stuff. Had to preface it all. A blockchain is one dimensional, right? So as we know dimensions, it can only go this way. It's only built this way. So this means if it reaches capacity, it has only one direction to move, backwards, creating transaction backlogs and relying solely on block time and block size to scale. We live in a four dimensional universe with X, Y, Z, and T for time as seen from Einstein's theory of relativity. Now, number space is three-dimensional. I mean, Brian, as we know, he made games. I started making games. So, I mean, I naturally think three-dimensionally with computers, which is fun. So, with that being there, we can use this space efficiently by scaling a distributed database blockchain into these three dimensions. So, this is where we introduce blockchain 3.0, but more appropriately, a multi-dimensional chain or a three-dimensional chain. So, what's a 3D chain? A 3D chain is capable of scaling in three directions rather than one direction. So the network needs to be able to have nodes with definitive roles in which they all contribute unique resources to the network. Now, the database needs to be able to partition but prevent a civil attack of bad data. And the nodes need to develop relationships with one another and a public reputation to utilize time as a security model. And the chain needs to not be concerned with advancements in quantum computers, but remain efficient and scalable. And always, microtransactions should be done on chain every time. No more centralized crap, no Lightning Network on chain. So we'll start here. This is how we solve quantum computers. So as you see this, this is called a signature chain. So we begin with the genesis. Now you're going to have a secret phrase. You could have it as a password. Think of it like your password logging into your own private cryptographic blockchain and a pin number because that's something you should always keep in your head. So in case your secret gets stole, it's going to be harder to, how should I say it, brute force it. So your genesis is in a way your registry of your signature chain. Now a next task means we're going to hash the living crap out of the public keys so that Grover's algorithm becomes your security because right now, we can experiment with some lattice-based cryptography if we want, but you don't want to use that as the sole only security model. So I mean, even with the next hash, you just concatenate, which means put two keys together, maybe just an experimental lattice key, and then an already proven, or, um, already proven ECC key. So you, know, you have that quantum security there, and then you already have the classical security here, and you need to crack both of them to get to it. So <laughs> the next hash basically makes your public key invisible to public knowledge. Nobody's going to know what it is. Now, you see the pub plus sig. That's every time you make a transaction, you're going to have to reveal that public key, which then you'll be able to verify it's the valid public key. It's the, how should I say it, the one that is authorized for movement to the next. So 
That will go into the transaction, which then assigns a new next task. So you see there, there's a little content contract. Like let's say, hey, I have this content, you know, I want this much nexus for it. If you want it, send it to this address here in this content contract and you'll get this content. And then you apply a next hash. Again, you can do multiple next hashes if you want to have multiple signature chains in parallel. But what that does is you never use the same key twice. And you never know the public key until you use it. Which means they can make quantum computers with billions of qubits and it won't do a damn thing. Because you are going to be hundreds of keys away. So with your secret and your pin that allows you to deterministically create billions and billions of keys with just your login system into the chain. So you see it goes through. Now you can have a register, which is like, hey, let's have a receive account. I want to receive some money here. Then you have another public SIG, now a trust. Like, let's say you make a trust block. You lock a trust. That's going to be on your chain. Now, the cool thing about this, too, is it's going to show your trust. You're going to build trust with this signature chain, which is going to enable people to have that reputation that you require. Now, it's also going to be building up your ability to lock transactions. We'll get to that in a second. Now, next has public SIG. You can be a voter. You can put a vote on for, let's say, that would be a network-wide vote. Then you assign the next hash, do another pub SIG to an organization or an organizer, which has other next hashes coming off of it, which would be kind of an organizational contract. We could call those DAOs, but they're going to be scripts or contracts designed specifically for certain purposes, just like you don't use Python to build everything. You don't use C++ to build everything. You don't use Java to build everything. The different languages have their different purposes because they have their practical applications. Fortran, I believe, was used for more mathematics. COBOL was used for business programming logic. C Sharp is for business logic. Python's for script kitties or whatever. And um, yeah, so I decided to say it. <laughs> and C++ is for high enterprise level applications like you know you don't see any game not written in C++ because it's a very low-level language it's a pain in your ass but it's worth it you know just like anything in life the pains in the ass I mean we got those girlfriends we love them but they're a pain in the ass <laughs> so you got the next hash and then the public sib and then let's say data ownership again right so dot 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 now this is where we get into content contracts like so let's look at musicians, right? So they have their content, but let's say I want to use their song. I don't, I don't know how to reach their song. I don't know how to find, I don't know how to contact. I got to go through this bureaucratic problem. But when you have a registry on there with your SIG chain, you'd be like, oh, well, I can verify this is this artist's SIG chain. Oh, here's their data ownership contract. Okay, well, they have these terms of their contract. Oh, I can use it in my movie? Oh, here's some Nexus, bam. Done. Then we're going to get rid of copyright infringement. And we're also going to be enhancing people's ability to monetize. Now here's where it gets pretty. So this is what a three-dimensional chain would look like. So we see we got the three axes. We got the X across, then we got the Y up, and we got the Z forward, right? So Z we would call time. Now B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, just consider those block locks. I'll give you a more top-down view of it on the next slide. But basically, when transaction volume gets spiked, when you have a higher frequency volume, it'll be like a sound wave. It'll be able to move out. And those will all link together in that direction and link together in that direction instead of a blockchain just being a ledger. This way, it can be this way. Now, the third dimension is weight. Now, I'll get into that a little bit more. Weight on the bottom and trust on the top. So that instead of having zero confirmation, one confirmation, two, you'll have a decimal number that will basically say this is how weighted it is. The further back it is in time, the more work that's been done on it, the more people have agreed on those transactions happening, the more people that have locked the minor locks, that is going to add weight to it. And therefore, they're going to create trust in the positive side. So you see the positive why. I guess I'll try to explain it a little here. data without the ability for somebody to just go out and fire up a node and control it.
Okay, so this is a top-down view. This would be X, and this would be Z. So the guys, the first one will start, lock one, right? Well, that's a little no solution sign. Just basically means there's no transactions in that interval. So we'll get to the next lock. So those are going to be weighted down to the previous interval. So you see these big, this is one block lock. Let's look at it like that. So instead of, oh, let me explain this right. Instead of proof of work being you make one hash to rule them all, miners are going to be working off of an interval. And from this interval, they're going to be agreeing on it and weighting the data the more they hash it. And so instead of having one hash, you could have thousands of hashes that are put into a Merkle tree, which makes it a decentralized mining pool. There will be no more mining pools. They need to go bye-bye. So we get to lock two, right? You can see these lines between these transactions. They're all linking back to each other, right? And they're linking to a couple of their previous guys. Now, they're all linking to each other horizontally on the Z, and they're linking to each other on the X. So you can see how now every one of these locks is going to be a different node role. So basically, this is the, uh, down here you see P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6. Think of that like a series of prime numbers or a prime constellation or whatever you want to call it. So that transaction nodes, that's their role. They're going to be verifying signatures. They're going to be creating signatures to sign off of their signature chain. And they're going to be, you know, giving a couple prime numbers for people to study too, to add, you know, another bit of cost. So that's going to be a true type of CPU miner because when you have a signature chain, you're going to have a limit. You're going to say, hey, well, you can only lock once per interval. Like, give everybody else a piece of cheese, too. So what that's going to allow it to do is that's going to prevent this arms race that we have with the work, but it's still going to create some of the positive qualities of proof of work where you have this cost and then other positive qualities where we have all this computation going on. So then we get to lock three. You can see that. That's linked. You got those two transactions. They're kind of woven together and those other series of prime numbers. And then we get to trust one. Now, you're familiar, you old Nexus guys, you're going to know the proof of stake system that we have started the whole trust system. Nexus proof of stake, it was written from the ground up, but now the stake is what you're going to use to make trust locks. Okay, so instead of these many, you know, verifying previous transactions, verifying signatures, you're going to have to hold your stake through that. And then you're going to get your interest rate, you're going to build your trust up that way, and you're going to lock it in at specific intervals. It'll be like rounds, think about it. So this is about a one minute span. 20 second locks here. Now the transaction locks can get smaller and smaller. It can automatically adjust to that based on your transaction capacity. Because I mean, if you have available space for, let's say one second, two second, three second, then it's gonna allow, you know, I mean, you got 5,000 transactions, it's gonna get big, but you don't wanna have, you know, 100,000 transactions in an interval if you don't have to. So it's gonna get down to one second on each one of those. So these trust locks, think about the major tr transaction locks. Those will be kind of like, I'm buying some bubble gum, I'm sending you 100 bucks, a grand, whatever. The trust locks are going to be like, I'm buying a car or I'm buying a house. Now, keep in mind, the trust lock will take about 20 seconds as far as it should. Now, I mean, this is still being built, so I can't say any definitive performance values of it, but this is why it's the introduction of the architecture of it. So the trust one is going to be going through there, and what that's doing is that's hashing these three locks and it's creating its own hash. And then other trust nodes are gonna be staking and doing that too, and they're gonna create a consensus, a democratic consensus with all the stake and saying, here's my trust, here's my weight, and that's gonna start weighting the chain more. First, the transaction nodes are gonna kinda of weight it like that. The more you have that are weighting it, the more it's gonna weight. And then the trust, they're gonna start weighting it deeper, and then we get to the mines, right? So these three trust blocks, or these two right here, trust intervals, and then this final one, those are gonna be the hashes that are needed to be included. Now you can just put all of the trust one, trust two into a Merkle tree for each one of them, just have the Merkle root, Merkle root. And so all you need to do to mine it would be to hash those Merkles so that a miner would only need to be transmitting 256 bytes at a time, maybe that for a block, and just submitting shares as fast as you want. Now, we'll wanna set a minimum difficulty, obviously on that, kind of how mining pools work, but that allows everybody to get a piece of the cheese, and then the reward at the end of it will be split up based on the proportion of your weight contribution. Now, this is how it's gonna look, because I know this is all techy and weird for you guys, but that's what it's gonna start looking. That's gonna be our baby. So, thank you guys for being here. And uh, I hope you enjoy this presentation. This was a little extra techy. But uh, I also hope it helps inspire some of you guys, get some more developers helping out. And uh, 
take this to the next level. Now, there's a lot more to come. This is the center, how should I say it, sphere. But there's going to be your voting layers on top of that, which work through this central ledger. And then we're going to have the routing layers and the kind of distributed computing on the outer, outer core. So keep in mind, this is the very beginning. And there's a lot more to come. Thank you. I guess we'll do, do we have a little time for questions? So how long do we got? Ten minutes. Ten minutes of questions. If anybody has questions, all right. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be a proof of work, but the security of it is not going to be based on the proof of work. The proof of work. Oh no, we. Uh, no, SK1024. Skyn and Kekik at a 1024-bit output length to have 512-bit quantum security. Anybody else? Back. Yeah, we could do that, but what it runs on right now is the lower level protocol, which is a polymorphic template protocol. And that's been tested up to five, 10,000 connections on some of the pools that we've had now. And it also, uh, it's basically based on polymorphism with a virtual process packet function. So it's really easy to create new protocols. And it's multi-threaded, so it's not done on the single. That's where Tritium actually is starting on the base levels, is it's actually getting rid of the whole Bitcoin backend and filling it with the LLP. Probably, and I'd, I mean, I'm not as knowledgeable about you on IP multicast, but I'm definitely going to look into that. So, I mean, that's probably definitely something we should consider. Yeah. Repeat what? Okay, okay, so you're saying um, to consider using IP multicast because it's a lot more scalable and more efficient than using one socket or having multiple sockets open on individual threads. Is that the correct question? Yeah, I mean, we'll definitely consider that, and there's definitely a lot of other solutions that are going to be coming out. The current solution is the lower-level protocol, but, I mean, considering that statement, I'll definitely look into it. Yes? The lower level library is a series of base level templates. And so you'll be able to create the higher levels from it. So you'll basically be able to, let's say, if you wanted to make a MySQL database, you'd have an LLP SQL protocol that would you know, match all of the exact packet messages of it, and then do the processing into the lower level database so that these higher level, these higher level inheritances of these templates will basically be capable of creating any type of stack you want. So what it's eventually going to become is called the L4 stack, is what we're calling it. And, uh, We'll get to talking about what we're going to be starting a first commercial application on it with, but lower level library, Linux lower level library, basically. And so it's going to be able to replace MySQL, PHP, but it's going to be designed also on the higher level templates or inheritance of those templates to be backwards compatible. So you could fire up an L4 stack, and then the LLD will automatically partition itself, and so it'll load itself so it'll create its own cluster itself based on whatever you want. And then other developers can create these higher level inheritances from the lower level library, which will let them sell this inheritance class for this and that and that and this. And it builds off of this one cent little core of it, which is highly efficient, very simple, light code that you can build all the higher levels off of, but you don't necessarily have to carry all the weight of all the generics with it. You can specialize it however you want from that central core. Oh, right on. <laughs> well, we're all learning, man. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Well, so will people be able to build ICOs on Nexus? I think 
Um, yet we're going to have an asset contracting engine in the future, so it's not going to just be an ERC-20 token standard. People will be able to take, you know, Bitcoin-based blockchains or even form Ethereum and use this as a scaling solution for them, so it's not exclusive just to Nexus. This architecture is here for everybody. We're building it. Other people, we're all building it together. We're all in here doing the same thing. We're all having a revolution, making things happen. So I think what needs to be considered with the ICOs, though, is a little bit more proper vetting of them because it's very easy for anyone to raise millions of dollars on very simple ideas that may or may not have honest intentions. So being, you know, having some sort of platform to be able to know or a vetting process is something that's definitely going to be considered and built to do. That's why we haven't just built it yet. I could build an asset engine really simply, but it takes time and the proper procedure to do it right so that we make sure that we can prevent some of these conundrums that we see because these ICOs can, sometimes they mimic some of the 2014 clone coins that were going around too. And, you know, I think people deserve to have the knowledge and a lot of new people have difficulty understanding the difference between an actual currency and an asset engine on Ethereum. So, I mean, coming full circle, yes, we're planning on that. It's going to take a bit of time to make sure it unfolds properly and to figure out the proper way to mitigate and reduce the ability for people to manipulate other people and steal their money, essentially. All right. Yep. Yes, yeah, so that's going to be the content system. Now, I mean, are you talking about just storing content for copyright? Oh, yeah, so, I mean, you'll be able to do that on-chain with content contracts, but it'll be an independent type of system. It's not going to have to be a main web interface. So with just a data contract, you'd say, you'd have the main web spot that people can go in and cap into, and then other people can upload their video, and they can monetize it directly with their content contract, which they set their terms of, hey, I want to monetize this much. You can use, you can watch my video once and stream it off of my content contract for 10 Nexus or five, or here's exclusive rights to it or whatever else. So yeah, that's going to definitely be possible. So don't think, I mean, I guess we're going to have to throw some of these terminologies out the window. Like smart contract doesn't really fit with us. We're, we're developing specialized scripting engines or specialized languages for specific purposes. Like content is one of them. You can do many things with content, music, videos, other things. You can have another type of contract, which is for just data storage for somebody to hold some files for. You can have encryption with the LLC. So think of it as a series of different languages that can all be woven together into an application, each one with their specific purposes so you don't carry the overhead and the junk of the things that you don't need for your purpose. Not having Turing completeness. Yes, yes. That's something that is, you know, I don't think completely necessary to do. But, you know, the outer level, like I said, this is the core. The outer, you got the voting levels, which we'll get to, and then the outer level, the distributed computing model, that will be you run whatever language you want on it, and people can get monetization from that, run it for you and process. But that's, that's still conceptually in the later stages, so I didn't want to dip too much into that. But the core ledger level, core engines, kind of like the Bitcoin scripting engine, are going to be capable of all these things on the bottom levels. And then, I guess, applications will be able to kind of utilize distributed computing, especially with the satellites and everything, too, eventually on the outer level. So there's three levels of it, and this is the inner core ledger level. Uh, one minute, one last question if anybody has it. Yeah. So that's going to be one of the voting groups, and that's there's going to be six voting groups. I'll get to that later, but that's going to give you, I mean, essentially it's going to be, it's going to help you build trust a little bit quicker because that's a kind of incentive and a cost in that when you're doing the trust locks, but it's also going to act as a currency voting system and the, the second tier, which is the voting level tiers, because I think in order to have successful voting systems, you have to have I guess, voice given to multiple types of resource input, kind of like, you know, miners are going to have a different opinion than guys that run exchanges and guys that trade and everything like that. So those are all going to be accounted for. And yes, currency will be something that will give you a vote of one of the groups or a part of that group. All right, cool. Well, that's another. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, sir. Our next session will begin at 1 o'clock in just a few moments.